Okay, that's better. Well, Thank you. Okay, that's great. Okay. So when Alan got in touch with me and he asked me to talk about Irish and our everyday lives, and I had to, I kind of thought about that and I thought, well, what I'll talk about, I suppose, in a way, is my own journey, my own tourist with the language, because tourist is the is the word for journey. And for me, there has been this kind of tourist journey with the language because I started learning Irish just over 10 years ago now. And I hadn't a word of the language. Not only did I, I not know the language, I didn't know anything about the language. I had no realization that the language is all around us and it's within our everyday speech, it's within our place names, it's all those things. And it was a real awakening to me. I mean, I had no issue with the language. I just didn't have any particular interest in it. Um, I'd never learned another language, even at school, I didn't learn another language. So to be starting out and to end up sort of falling in love with Irish was a, a very unexpected place for me to be. So I'm going to share some of the, the things that I discovered. And I apologise in advance to maybe maybe more knowledgeable people among the audience who will say, oh, well, sure, that's all really basic stuff. But I think you need to realise where people who don't get the opportunity to engage with the language are coming from because they have this, they have this view of what they think the language is and, you know, but have no real knowledge of its beauty, of its significance and the length of time it's been here. And again, as I've already said, the fact that it is all around us. So, as I've already said, Taurus means journey. And the organisation that I ended up starting in East Belfast Mission is called Taurus. We have been going now almost 10 years and we have taught hundreds and hundreds of people, about 300 people a year, sign up for the language, the majority of them from the unionist community. And it still shocks me and saddens and depresses me when I see people's attitudes sometimes to the language. So, for instance, I was asked to give a talk today to the friendship group and um, friendship is maybe <laughs> stretching as far from some of the attitudes that were displayed on today. Um, the majority of them were positive but there were some very unpleasant um, remarks and attitudes because I was going to tell them something about the Irish language and I, I find that very sad because nobody would behave like that if it was French or German or Russian or any other language. And why would you? You know, a language is a language and the Lord made them all. So I didn't know 11 years ago that I was born in Belfast. I didn't know that Bell is your mouth and Farsh is the Sandbank Ford. I didn't know that our place names were anglicised versions of the original Irish language places because this whole island at one time was Irish speaking. I had no idea and I also think it's really sad that you could be born in a place and spend your whole life living somewhere and have no realisation of what its name actually is or that it has, it has a meaning. But Shanko, Shan Kill, Old Church, Kill is the, the word for church in Irish, and there's no K in the Irish language, so it's always a hard C. Shan means old, so it's the, the site of probably the, the first church in Belfast. You know, how beautiful is that? I think this was one of the ones that really struck home to me because I'm from East Belfast and, you know, I've known the Craigie Road all my life. And I never really questioned why, though it was spelled Craigie, we called it Craigie. And the only time I ever heard it called Craigie was maybe by English newscasters during the, the sort of troubled years or people who were trying to be posh and they talked about the Craigie Road. Because for me, it was always Craigie. And it was only when I started to learn Irish and I started to discover about the place names that I was told then that this townland is Am Craigie, which means the rocky place. And if you know the Craigie Road at all, well then you know if you walk the Craigie Road, you come to the rocky road. Mm. 
So these are the messages that surround us. Another one that is very close to my heart is Laganil, because my mommy was born in Laganil, from Laganil. And again, growing up, I never heard it called anything but Laganil. And more recently, I've heard it called Laganil and all sorts of things. And I said to my mommy, well, you know, like my mommy's 82, what do you call the place you're from, mommy? And she says, what are you talking about? And I says, tell me the place that you're from, Laganil. And I said, yeah. And I thought, well, why does she pronounce it Laganil? And I know now why she pronounces it Laganil and why older people call it Laganil. Because the original townland name, Laganil, is the hollow of the limestone. And again, not far from the limestone road. So look at all those beautiful messages that are in the place names. And if you don't have access to the language, you don't know anything about your own environment. And imagine denying yourself that. I think that's very sad. This is the Gaelic word for fort. There's a number of words for fort. So this is one of them. It seems there were different sizes of forts. And um, there were a lot of forts in Ireland. They weren't what we think of, like sort of cowboy and Indian forts. There were fortified places, maybe fortified to keep your cattle in and protect it from raiders or whatever. There were, there were families, sort of extended families lived in, in these forts. So this is one of the words for fort. And I was thinking about the Lisburn Road because obviously your, your own church there. And it was interesting when I thought about Lisburn because Lis is a Gaelic word, but Burns is a Scots word, um, Ulster Scots, and it means stream. And there's a combination of both Scots and Gaelic combined in one place name, which I love. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the original name of Lisburn was Lisnagarawak, Lisnagarawak, which means the Fort of the Gamblers. And I'm told that it was called the Fort of the Gamblers because, again, these, these old forts, these, these rafts and forts, they had been used in primitive times and then they were discarded and left. So more modern Irish people didn't understand what they were. So they thought they were where the furries had lived. They were the home of the furries. So they were a bit scared of them and you didn't go near them at night. So you didn't go near them at night. This was an ideal place for gamblers to gather and they could gamble in peace without being disturbed. So listen to Garawak, the fort of the gamblers. Listen to Shara and East Belfast. Again, this was one of those moments for me when I thought, oh my goodness. This is Irish. This is Irish and I never knew this. So listen to Shara is a primary school on the Craigie Road and this is their badge. You see it at the top there, there's four horses and it says the Fort of the Foals because the original townland name, listen Sharak, Lis Fort, Na of the Sharak Foals. So whoever named listen to Shara primary school and decided on their badge, they had a knowledge of the language. They had a knowledge of the townlands. And for me, again, that's fascinating. And every day, you know, people would go past Listen Shara Primary School, but they don't recognise the language in it. And sadly, I sat in a, a public meeting in the new um, leisure centre when it was opening and Belfast City Council were doing a bit about bilingual, trilingual, multilingual signage. And there's very few people there, I have to say. And I was there because of my job. And somebody shouted, there'll be no Irish language signage in this place. We're not having it. But listen, Shara, it is Irish. It is Irish. And that's the sad thing when you don't allow people to know the truth. You know, and I mentioned it to the council workers and I said, you know, if you had just a big picture of foals up there, that would be a nice nod to the Irish language name. That this place takes itself from, you know. Croc is the word for hill in Irish, anglicised to knock, and all of our place names were anglicised in the, um, the 1800s, uh, whenever the Ireland was first mapped, and the English spelling 
names. They, they sort of went round Ireland and said, what's this place called? And they said, oh, right, that sounds like, and they give it English spelling. So the majority of the names in Ireland are what's called transliterated. That means given English spelling. Some of them were translated, places like Newcastle. Newcastle, very English name, but the original name was Cashley New, Newcastle. And a small number of them were just renamed, but the majority of them were transliterated. The Irish name was given an English spelling. So this is one of them, croc. Um, croc means knock, um, sorry, transliterated to knock means hill. So anywhere that you see the word knock in our place names, it just means hill. So here's a, for instance, another school in East Belfast. And this is the, the little primary school up beside our 24 hour Tesco's. And it's Knock Nagunay, Knock Nagunay. The original town land name, Croch Naginyanay, Croch Naginyanay. So Croch Hill, Na of the Ginyanay rabbits. And even my pronunciation of Croch is very Ulster because there are different dialects of Irish in the island of Ireland. And in this part of the world, we speak Gaelic Ulu. So we pronounce that an as an R. We do the same thing with the word for women is, well, if you were in the South, you would say Mana. We say Mara, Mara. We pronounce that an as an R. So we don't say knock, we say crock, crock. But the fact that the name is knock says that a long time ago, it was pronounced as knock and then the sounds changed, as language does. And we can see the same thing in the English language. Now, what's also interesting is the rabbits, can you know? Because rabbits aren't made of the Ireland. They were brought in by the Norman French. So there you go. Another place name, and this is one I love, and it's finicky. So fin means blonde. And um, I, have, I have a little grandson, and his name's Finn. Um, his name is um, mine's meant blank. Like, <sighs> sorry, sorry, tripping me. His name's Finlay, and Finlay means comes from the Irish again, Finlayach, which means blonde hero. Finlayach, blonde hero with these names all around us and the beauty of them. And I'm always telling Finlay, you're a blonde hero son. Now, his parents, his, his daddy's from Trulloch Street and he wouldn't let me spell it in Gaelic. He says, no, no, we'll spell it in English, Linda, but I don't mind, he's, he's, a, he's a blonde hero. So there you go. Still working on it. Maybe someday he'll, he'll spell it in Gaelic. So Finnicky, Finn, when you're talking then about land, means white and Aki, is a field. So Finnachy, the white field. Finnachy, the white field. And if you know Finnachy, then you'll know that there is a cafe called the White Field up in Finnachy. So they know their place names. Here's another one. Drumbo. Drumbo. Drimbo. So Drim is a ridge. And that was transliterated to Drum drum and that's where we get C.S. Lewis's drumlins from, those little soft curved hills. Baw is the word for cow in Irish, so drum baw, transliterated to drum bow. And for me this is fascinating, you know, somebody who had no background in the language, who knew nothing about the language, to now be able to drive about our countryside and go, oh that means this and that means that and look there's that word and there's that word. And just to have that knowledge is wonderful. Where before they were just meaningless bits of meaningless letters. And in fact, I suppose one of the things that struck me when I started to learn about the place names was that I'd never questioned before that these same um, word parts kept coming up, you know, and I had never questioned why you've got the same place names or, you know, bits of place names but that these things actually meant something. So what I discovered was that 95% of the place names in Northern Ireland come from the Irish language. 
So how sad it is when I hear people saying it's a foreign language. How can it be foreign when you're surrounded by it and you're surrounded by the beauty of it? And why would you deny yourself that? Now, a lot of people I find are very interested in place names, but they don't like signage. I don't know what, the, what this is about signage, but there are there is an issue with signage. And yet, if we understood the place names better, maybe there wouldn't be an issue with signage. I feel a kind of a soft way with the signage because I'm quite happy with the signage, obviously. Um, and maybe tourist signage, both for Scots and Irish, because I think tourists would be very interested and I think it'd be another way of selling the beauty of our country when people understand the beauty of the place names. And I feel that Scots as well. My um, eldest daughter married a fellow from Carrick and she lives down in Bally Carrick. And when I take my grandchildren home, I have to go up to Tong Lonan. And I don't know if you know Tong Lonan on the way to Bally Carry, just outside Eden. And it is like a witch's tongue and it's beautiful. And of course, we know Lonan is the, the Scots word for lame. So to me, these things, they have beauty, they have meaning, they have historical value and they belong to us all. You know, you can't take Scots and Irish and divide them up nice and neatly and say this is yours and this is yours because doesn't work like that. As a people in this place, we we transcend that. You know, we we sort of take bits from everywhere. I think Bali, the Bali's really emphasize that. So Bali was um, the Anglicization of Bala. Bala. Again, if you're in the South, you would say Balia, but in Ulster we say Bala, Bala. It originally meant home, and as homes became kind of bigger and extended families, it means now like a town. So it's the word for town. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the valleys all over Ireland, but not just in Ireland, in Scotland and in the Isle of Man as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how the language travelled. Now, what's interesting is that it's always linked with another word. So it's a town or townland of something. And that other word might be a name. So it could be, you know, John's townland. It could be another Irish word. It could be a Scots word. It could be an English word. It could even be a Norman French word. Because that's the complication of who we are in Northern Ireland. We draw on all of those things. We're not just one people or one tribe. We come from lots of places and we made this place our home. And those different traditions, those different backgrounds, those different places, those different languages, all live very happily in our place names. Now, sadly, we haven't managed to do that yet. We're still very much on that journey, on that tourist, but we do see it represented in our place names. And I'll give you just a, an, a, for instance, of some of these. Bally Gowan, for instance. So Gowan in Irish is a blacksmith. So Bally Gowan is the town of the ba blacksmith. Bally Carry, where I said my daughter's from, that's the town of the weir. Balnafai, um, it is the town of the, the, the sort of grass, the flat grass, so the lawn, basically. Balnahinch is one of my favourite, Balnahinchia. So it is the town of the River Island, the River Island. And it seems at one time it used to flood and then Balna Hinch would have been left like a little island in between these rivers flooding. Bally Nur, Balia and Ur. So Ur is a yew tree. So it's just the townland of the yew tree. And, um, you know, it's just, just beautiful, absolutely beautiful when you have an insight into some of the place names. Now, as I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about how the, the language travels. So the Celtic languages, again, fascinate me because I didn't know that the Celtic languages were spoken throughout the British Isles at one time. And sometimes, you know, people have this view of the Irish language as something, something divisive, something that is used to kind of separate us. And that's not my view of the language. In fact, my view is the absolute opposite. I see it as something 
that links us. It's a linguistic link between these islands because Irish is one of the family of Celtic languages and Celtic languages were spoken all throughout the British Isles at one time. England was a Celtic speaking place, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, all of these places. But these are the ones that survive today and this is them in their own languages. So there we have them. We have Cymru, which is Welsh, Curwach, which is Cornish, Gaelic, Irish Gaelic, Gaelic, Scots Gaelic, Gaelic, Manx Gaelic. So they are the Celtic languages which still survive today. And there are three Gaelic languages, Irish, Scots and Manx. And they all originated in Ireland. And at one time they were all the same language and now they are known officially as sister languages. I've been to the Isle of Man, I've been to Scotland, I've met speakers of the language, I've seen the signage, it's just wonderful. And to go over and to go to Scotland and to see what it just looks like Irish, it's just fabulous. And I remember the first time going to Scotland and, and visiting the Gaelic speaking parts of Scotland and I felt very sad in some ways because what I saw were people, mostly Presbyterians, who were able to, I suppose, enjoy, celebrate their Scottishness and didn't have anything to do with their religious background, didn't have anything to do with their political background. And I just thought, you know, we don't have the freedom to do that in Northern Ireland. Because if you're a Catholic and you love the Irish language and you're into your Irish culture, then you're obviously a Raven Republican. And if you're a Protestant, you're a Lundy. And that's so sad. I spoke in a Presbyterian church on the Isle of Lewis where people's first language is Gaelic. And I told them about my work and I tried to explain to them some of the challenges. And they just, they were just shocked and they said, but why, Linda, why would anybody think it's an issue speaking Irish? Why wouldn't people just love the language? You know, and they just did not understand it. And these were very conservative Presbyterian people. And it was really impossible to get across to them the very sad and toxic nature of Northern Ireland. This is the Isle of Man, and there we have the word again. So Falch, Falch in Irish, Falch in Scottish Gaelic, and Falch in the Isle of Man. And again, the language is all over the place, lots of signage, and um, the language died out in the Isle of Man. Well, it did and it didn't. It was the rumours of its demise were a little exaggerated and people were still speaking it. The last native speaker, the last person who had it as, as his first language was a man called Ned Madra, and he died in the 1970s. And they have a, a sort of a Ned Madra lecture every year. And I was very honoured to be invited over to do the Ned Madra lecture a number of years ago. And I went to his house and visited where he lived. And I heard recordings of native speakers from, I think it was from the 1940s. And it was amazing because although people in the Isle of Man now speak with this very soft sort of Liverpool accent, accent when you heard people speaking Gaelic or Gael, Gael, sorry, Gael, it was a very much like an Ulster accent. And the Gael is very easy for us as Irish speakers to understand. That's actually easier than, than Gaelic for us to understand because it's like a simplified form of Irish. So very, very interesting. But again, these lovely linguistic links, because we are the same people. We traveled about these islands, we settled, we are the same people. Here we have it in Irish. So Falcha. The Irish language is used by some unexpected groups and again in my journey walking about and suddenly going oh my goodness that's Irish that's Irish on the walls that's Irish on the flags Red Hand Commando 
Lal Jarik Abu to be Yarik. They've left their, their little um, aspiration off. So victory to the red hand. Now, I find it very strange when loyalists tell me that they find the language offensive. Well, don't put it on your walls then. Don't put it on your flags. Don't use it. Don't have it in your names. Don't have it in your place names or your surnames. I was also really shocked when I found out about the Presbyterian Church because I am a Presbyterian. And in 1833, the Presbyterian General Assembly termed the Irish language our sweet and memorable mother tongue. And in the 1840s, they made it a requirement for all of their trainee ministers to have a knowledge of the Irish language. And there's a number of reasons for that, because if you look at the early Presbyterian Church in Ireland, then there are two things going on. First of all, you have whenever the plantations came, the majority of people who came here were lowland Scots and they would have been Scots speakers. Now, when you look at the Scots language, it's full of Gaelic, absolutely full of Gaelic. But some of the people who came here were Gaelic speakers, they were Highland Gaels. There were also Manx Gaels who were planted in Northern Ireland as well, um, around County Down. Names like Crangle are Manx Gaelic names. So Presbyterian churches, a lot of their congregations, their first language wasn't English. And also when you look at the early Presbyterian churches, there's a lot of converts, there's a lot of Irish Gaelic names. So a lot of the churches would have had sermons in English and sermons in Irish. And if you go back to the early churches, you can see that. Now, the Belfast branch of the Gaelic League was formed in a part of Belfast. And you can have to think about which part of Belfast that would be. Now, that's known today as Conroe na Gaelica. And Conroe na Gaelica have been at the, the foremost of the um, kind of fight for Irish language rights. But the Belfast branch of that organisation began in East Belfast, not West Belfast. And it was this house on the Bearsbridge Road, number 32 Bearsbridge Road, on the 19th of August, 1895, the Belfast branch of the Gaelic League was formed. And the Gaelic League was headed up by very high-ranking Protestants, ministers and army people and all sorts of people like that. There was the Bangor branch of the, the Gaelic League. There was the Bloomfield branch of the Gaelic League. The Gaelic League was all over Ireland. I want to think now just about some of the words that we use every day. And again, when I did this, put this little talk together, I was picking bits out of everywhere because it wasn't what to put in, it was what to leave out. So this is one of my favourites because I didn't know until I started learning Irish that when I went in and asked for a barn brack, I was asking for barn and brack. Barn is a little loaf and brack is spackled. It actually is the word for trout. And that's how you say spackled in Irish, barn brock, spackled loaf. Or the banshee that I was told about as a child and we were all terrified in case it cried outside your door because it signified there was going to be a death. Well, ban is the word for woman in Irish and sheog is a furry. So the banshee is a furry woman. So all our lives, you know, we were using these words of the Irish language with no knowledge of what they were, no knowledge of what language they came from, no knowledge at all. Brogue, it's the Irish word for shoe. Everybody knows brogue. Probably most people have worn a pair. It's just shoe. Babber. People think of it as Ulster Scots, and yes it is, but where did it come from? It was taken out of Gaelic and borrowed into Scots. Clabber, it's the Gaelic word for mud. And lots of words in Ulster Scots are actually Gaelic words. There's a big 
crossover and a big overlap. And again, it frustrates me. I mean, I've been in situations where I've given a talk about Irish and I remember a woman saying to me, I'll stick to my own language dear Ulster Scots. And the lack of understanding that it's full of Gaelic. And that they aren't to two polarised things. They are two separate languages, yes, but they overlap. And also that when you embrace one, you embrace the other. And why is it in Northern Ireland we feel that to support one thing, we have to reject something else? Can you not be a tea drinker and enjoy a cup of coffee as well? You know, it's a very sad situation we find ourselves in here and a very frustrating one. Dulles. I'm sure we've all had a bit of Dulles. And again, it comes from the Irish because that's what the Irish did, they ate seaweed. Sparren. Sparren is the word for purse or wallet. So a sparren is simply a furry purse. There you go. And whiskey is the anglicised ishka baha. So ishka is the word for water, baha is life. So whiskey comes from ishka baha, the water of life. And that's why the Irish and the Scots are great drinkers, because they're just trying to quench their thirst. Simple as that. Even the structure of our speech, and I, I found this really, really interesting because I didn't know that the way that we spoke against Hiberno English, we don't speak um, standard English, and it comes from the Irish. And as an English, a native English speaker, learning Irish, what I wanted to do was I wanted sometimes to put the Irish onto my English and say, no, no. And it was the same thing in Ireland when people started to speak English and they did it for, you know, work and, um, you know, because the English was becoming the, the dominant language. So they tried to take the English and put it on their Irish. So we get these strange kind of structures that have stayed with us. So in standard English, we might say he went out. But in our regard of his bad English, we could say things like, he's after gone out. He's after gone out. Tashe in ye a gollamach. Tashe in ye a gollamach. He is after going out. A mach out. Tashe, he is in ye after a gull going out. So that's where it comes from. That's a good form, a good structure in Irish. Irish has what's called a continuous verb. There's a verb for things that happen now and again, and then there's a different verb for things that happen every day. So in English, we might say he is here every Monday. In our bad English, we may say, he bees here on a Monday. Now we know what that means, he bees here. We know that means he's here every Monday, he bees here on a Monday. But people would turn their nose up at that. But that's really good, it's good Irish. Being Shane Shaw Jaloon. Being Shane Shaw Jaloon. He bees here. Being Shane, he bees. And Shaw here, Jaloon, on Monday. Standard English would say, Have you brought your coat? We would say, Have you your coat with you? Have you your coat with you? Because Irish is a prepositional language. Lots of prepositions that we join up. And will the hot a lot? And will the hot a lot? Have you your coat with you? Lot with you? And will the hot a lot? In English, you would say, Have you caught a cold? We don't say that. We say, Have you the cold on you? And why do we say colds are on you? Why do we say hungers are on you? Why do we say thirsts are on you? Because that's how you structure it in Irish. And will them slide north? And sliding or and I've got the cold on me. And that's where we get these things from. So every day we're using these structures and we have no insight as to why. He lost my money. No, he lost the money on me. How she interrogate or him. He broke her window. No, he broke the window on her. Rishan in your he. 
None of those structures are standard English. They're Hiberno English. They come from the Gaelic. And they're rich and they're beautiful and they're historical and they belong here and they're what make us individual. Again, more history. Um, I'm at Queen's University at the moment. Um, I went to Queen's over 20 years ago to do a degree in English and I'm back now doing a degree in Irish. And I'm a member of Common Gaelic. Common Gaelic was the very first um, group, the very first society in Queen's University. And it was way back in 1906. And it was formed by a man called William MacArthur. And he was the first president of the society as well as the founder. William MacArthur is a product, or was a Protestant from the Belmont Road and he spell fast. And I was asked to speak with Common Gaelic, the High or Common Gaelic. And I said it was very fitting that they had invited a woman over from East Belfast because their, their president and their founder was a man from East Belfast. At the minute, Common Gaelic want Irish language signage to be returned to the university. And they also want something that every single university uh, in the British Isles who teaches languages, a local language has, and that is a, a um, a sort of a, a, a koniha, a, um, a language community, language community. So in Wales, if you, you go to one of the Welsh um, universities to study Welsh, you can live with other Welsh speakers. You can do the same in Scotland. You can do the same in um, other parts of Ireland. You can't do that in Queen's University. And Queen's University have said, no, it would be divisive. Now, I'm a Protestant studying Irish. I run a scholarship scheme where we pay for other Protestants to do Irish in university. How is that divisive? If they wanted to go and live with other Irish speakers to improve their, their language skills. And if anything, if you're a Protestant, it would be of more benefit to you because you have less, you know less people who speak Irish, you get less opportunities to speak Irish. So having the opportunity to go to university and live among Irish speakers would be amazing, like going to the Gale Talk. So, you know, why would a university not do that? And I also think it's very sad that, you know, I'm studying Irish at Queen's. I'm very proud of learning Irish. I'm very proud of being able to speak Irish. Sometimes I don't feel that Queen's is very proud of the language, even though they have an Irish language department. And I find that really odd and a bit strange. Even the chains of office of our Belfast Lord Mayor are in Irish. And they say, Aaron Gubra. Ireland forever. Now, if you go down to Dublin and you have a look at the chains of office for the Dublin Lord Mayor, it has King Billy on it. Somebody's mentioned they should maybe do a swap, but I think we're all right as we are. I think we're okay. I think Billy likes Dublin and I think we like the Irish language here. It's even all around us in our buildings. And this was another shock for me on my journey, on my tourist with the language. And I started to realise it was on buildings. And if you like very expensive tea, you might know this hotel, the Merchant Hotel. And if you have a look the next time you're there, and this is above the, the door, and it says Lau, Eric and Erin, Red Hand of Ireland. Now, you get the same thing above St George's Market. You get the same thing here in Bangor. You get the same thing on the Newton Arch Road on the Ulster Bank because it's the motto of the Ulster Bank. It's outside St George's because it's very fashionable in 19th century Belfast to have these Irish language signs above buildings. And obviously a lot of our buildings we lost them during the Troubles and redevelopment and also the sort of false facades over the front of, of buildings, modern facades. So it'd be really interesting to know how many were originally there. You can see this one in Bangor particularly well because it's, it's painted in. So Lau, 
Jarek, Erin, red hand of Ireland. So Lau is your hand, Jarek is red, and then obviously Erin, Ireland. This is the one I want to finish on, and I, how are we going? Yeah, I think that's just about the right time. And I'm finishing on this one really because I love it. And it's one that was told to me when I was in Donegal, and I didn't know, and it, it just really, people say, what's your favourite phrase in Irish or something? So I'm sure you all recognise the fuchsia flower here. And the fuchsia, of course, it's not native to Northern Ireland. It's not native to Ireland. I think it's probably Chinese or something. I'm not 100% sure, but lots of plants were brought to the, the UK um, and the Ireland in the, in the sort of Victorian times when there was a, a great interest in, in collecting all these new species. So whenever the fuchsia flower came to Donegal and it was planted, it was used as a windbreak and it really loved our climate and it, it just grew madly. And locals saw it and they thought it was beautiful. They'd never seen anything so intricate, so delicate, so colourful, so wonderful. So they called it Jorah J. Jorah J. God's Tears. So there you go. That's what God's Tears look like, according to the Irish people. So I'm going to stop my share there. And... Um.